So I am Kim Channel. I'm a research associate with Lisa, and, and most people don't know what Lisa is because we're kind of a small program and that's work with us. So uh, let me explain a little bit about what we are, what we do, so you have a better idea of why we were asked to be here today to give you this overview of climate change impacts in Great Lakes. So Lisa is the Great Lakes Integrated Sciences and Assessments Program. We are a NOAA-funded program, so we are a subset of the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, and we're housed at both. University of Michigan and Michigan State University, so I'm at U of M in our U of M office. And we are one of NOAA's 11 Regional Integrated Sciences and Assessment Centers, or RESAs, who uh, RESAs represent various regions across the country with LISA representing the Great Lakes states and part of Southern Ontario. And the mission of all RESAs is to bring science and or research and decision making together to better inform uh, natural resource management, planning, public policy, and so on. But what does that really mean? What do we do? So there's this spectrum of knowledge sharing, if you want to call it that. And there's two ends of the spectrum, and the two ends don't always meet. So there's the research end of the spectrum, which is organizations like government labs or universities who actually do the research, produce the information, and publish the results. And then the service end is decision makers, people who are uh, stakeholders, urban planners, natural resource managers, et cetera, who actually use the information from the research end to make more informed decisions in the face of climate change. The problem is a lot of the information produced by the research end is not always in a format that is accessible and usable and even useful to people on the service end who don't have a background in that particular uh, field of science. So Lisa kind of sits in the middle to bridge this gap between the production of information and the actual use of information. And we do that typically by uh, taking existing information like climate models or historical climate data and we tailor it to <coughs> specific locations for our, our partners, either cities or organizations. We tailor it locally so that it can better meet their end user needs and be actually useful and usable to them. And in doing this, we ask three major questions. What has happened? What are the historical climate trends? What will happen? What do the climate models project for the future, for the coming century? And what are the impacts that we actually experience? And these are the questions that I'll be focusing on for the next 30 minutes or so. <coughs> uh, so first, I, I kind of broke this up into three different sections. First, I'll go through regional climate change trends for the Great Lakes, specifically temperature and precipitation, uh, in terms of what the historical trends are and what models tell us will happen in the future. And then I'll go through a section specifically on local impacts to the Great Lakes, and then I'll, I'll end with a few quick examples of some adaptation efforts that Lisa has been a part of or uh, a partner on in the past, just to get you thinking for the rest of the day. But before I get into any of that, I want to tell you a story. And I almost cut this because I'm not a very good storyteller, but I think that it ties into what we're doing. And this particular event was actually a catalyst for me in that at the time of this event, I was already studying climate science and I was already doing Great Lakes research, but this is what made me realize that communication is equally as important as research because if you don't communicate the facts, you're going to end up with situations like this on far larger and more consequential scales. So for some context, my parents have had a place near Lake Charlevoix, not on Lake Charlevoix, but near it for about 17 years now and they're in this little neighborhood that has some private docks that are just managed by the residents. There's no one higher up managing it. and it just works by the old people move out, when people move in, they move up on the wait list, they get a spot, and they buy their own lifts. And then we just manage it ourselves in terms of hiring uh, some dock guys to come in and uh, put the docks and the lifts in at the beginning of the year and then take them out uh, at the end of the season. And for the most part, this has gone along smoothly, even though you know, we had some years of really low water levels that gave us some issues in terms of having to push the docks out really far and it was too shallow. But for the most part, we got by until 2015 when chaos ensued. And I'm, I'm not exaggerating when, <laughs> when I say this. So what happened in 2015? Well, this happened in 2015. So a quick geography lesson. Lake Charlevoix is connected to Lake Michigan uh, through Brown Lake. And that means that the water levels on Lake Charlevoix fluctuate with the water levels on Lake Michigan. So the water levels on Lake Michigan, and really all the Great Lakes, uh, went from being below average for almost over a decade really, to suddenly being above average in a very short period of time. People just 
didn't know what to do with themselves. You would think it's a simple solution. You know, water levels have been high in the past. Um, you should just have to pull the docks in closer to the shore. Uh, lifts are adjustable, just have everyone increase the height of their lifts. Uh, so we tried that, we brought the docks in as, as far as we could, but then we ran into a slight problem, and that's that about a third of the people uh, who, who have slips or who have lifts had moved in during this period of low water levels. So when they bought their lifts, they bought them for the current conditions, and we're not aware that water levels on the Great Lakes can fluctuate that much. So when we tried to put their lifts in in the spring, and they you know, cranked them up as high as they could go, they still were not high enough or tall enough to keep their boats out of the water. So everybody was arguing about how to best handle this in a way that benefited everybody, but really it was just everybody arguing for their own benefit. And we ended up going through three different dock guys. The first guy ended up quitting halfway through because he couldn't figure out how to get the lifts in because it just wasn't going to work. They weren't going to keep the boats out of the water. The second guy came in and said, oh, I'll put them up, uh, I'll put the short ones up on cinder blocks. I've, I've had to do that before, so apparently this is a common problem, not just with us. Uh, he ended up getting fired because he was kind of a jerk and he threatened to push somebody into the lake. You know, super mature adult, uh, sensible conversation, clearly. And then we ended up with a third doc guy that took them out at the end of the year and used him ever since. So it all worked out in the end. There was so much ridiculous arguing and chaos and money lost because we had to hire three different people to work on these docks over the summer that all easily could have been avoided had people simply been informed of the fact that water levels in the Great Lakes fluctuate, and you need to take that into account when you're figuring out what kind of lift to buy. And just to think bigger picture and why I'm on this tangent in the first place, uh, a lot of people have tried to claim that, well, climate has changed in the past. Why should we really be worried about it? Well, the climate has never changed as rapidly as it is now when humans and civilization were around. So we built our, our infrastructure, our entire societies around the current climate. We don't know anything else. But fortunately, we do have some idea of the future, and we know what the historical trends are, which gives us yeah, even, an even better idea of what to expect in the future. And we can use this information, this knowledge, to plan for, and prepare for, and adapt to the coming changes. We're not just going in blind. So by being here today and by committing to adaptation efforts, you're essentially saying, I don't want to be the person who bought the wrong lift because they were not informed of basic facts about the environment. I want to be the person that makes scientifically informed decisions about the resiliency of my community. Right, that's that's the goal, right? So hopefully that wasn't too much of a tangent and maybe put things into perspective. Uh, if not, hopefully it was at least in my <laughs> So with that, let's talk about climate change. So climate change is a very broad, sort of difficult to comprehend issue just because it's so, so large. And there's three different scales of thinking about climate change. So there's the global scale when we think about increases in global average surface temperature or changes in atmospheric circulation and ocean currents and convection. But I don't know about you, but a two degree increase in global average surface temperature means absolutely nothing to me. I can't, that's not tangible. But what does mean a little more to us is regional changes in things like temperature trends and precipitation patterns and seasonality and extremes and variability. And these regional trends or changes then translate into impacts at the local level. And this is what's actually tangible. These are the things that we, that we feel and experience. And these are the things that we need to adapt and prepare for. Because really the degree of impact or the, the damage that it can cause is really dependent more on our ability to manage our responses to these impacts and adapt to them. So with that, let's talk about regional climate change trends in the Great Lakes. And all of the numbers that you'll see on the next 10 slides or so are for the Great Lakes Basin, so they're averaged over the entire Great Lakes. And all of this uh, information is either from the third national climate assessment or LISA uh, station data or climate vision data. So it's all publicly available on our site if you want to know any more information about any of this. So let's start with the most straightforward, which is temperature. So Great Lakes average temperature has increased by two degrees Fahrenheit since 1951, and it's projected to increase by another four to six degrees by the mid 21st century. And I know I said, let's start with the most straightforward temperature, but unfortunately, it's not that simple. Uh, if it were, my job would be a lot easier. So there are variations both spatially and temporally and seasonally that mean that it won't affect every part of the Great Lakes Basin the same. 
and one of those variations is seasonal. So while the average annual uh, temperatures in the Great Lakes have increased by two degrees, the winter average temperatures have increased by 2.8 degrees. And I know 0.8 degrees probably doesn't seem like very much, but we're talking about averages over many, many decades, over a very long period of time. And that's actually a pretty significant number. That means that the winters, winters in the Great Lakes are warming faster than the rest of the year, and this has implications for snowfall trends and ice cover and other things that we've come to associate with winter in the Great Lakes. And there are also variations in uh, these temperature changes between different regions of the Great Lakes. So this is a map showing future projections for temperature changes by the 21st century. And you can see that the northern part of the Great Lakes is expected to see higher increases in temperature than the southern part of the Great Lakes. So yes, temperature is increasing everywhere, but it will not necessarily increase the same everywhere. So certain solutions that work for one city in the Upper Peninsula might not work for somewhere, say, in Ohio or Indiana that is not going to be seeing the same changes. And then just to add another fun layer to this equation, the changes in temperature are not even consistent between the air and the water. So the Great Lakes themselves are actually warmer, warming faster than the surrounding air. I think Lake Superior is warming two times faster than the surrounding air in the, Great, or in the Lake Superior Basin. And this combined with warmer uh, winter temperatures has led to longer ice-free periods on the lakes, as I'm sure many of you have noticed if you live around here. And then this has also led to changes in the length of our seasons. So the frost-free season, it's also called the growing season, which is the length of time between the last spring freeze or late winter freeze and the first fall freeze has increased by 15 days since 1951 and is projected to increase by 30 to 70 more days by the end of the 21st century. So that's one to two months more that crops could potentially grow. And this is typically because the spring freezes or winter freezes are occurring earlier and earlier, meaning that spring is coming earlier. But this, again, is just the average. It doesn't mean that this is going to be the case every year. We can't rely on this to always happen. Uh, and I think this year is a perfect example with this never ending winter of 2018 that we just came out of. At least I think we came out of it. We could have 18 inches of snow next week, I wouldn't be surprised. And then lastly, for temperature, uh, I've mostly talked about average trends, but you will also be seeing an increase in the number of extreme heat days, or the days above 90 and 95 degrees. And these are typically experienced more at a, a local scale, so Toski might have an extreme heat day, but Elk Rapids or Traverse City might be just fine uh, a few miles south. So these also uh, can have implications on public health, and that's why even though we don't have basin-wide trends, this is still a pretty big concern for the Great Lakes Basin and beyond. All right, so enough about temperature. Let's talk about the other big one, which is precipitation. So annual total precipitation has increased by about 12% in the Great Lakes Basin. But lake temperature, these trends are not uniform across the region. So Southeast Michigan has seen an increase uh, of 17% of annual precipitation, whereas the Western Upper Peninsula has actually seen a slight decrease. And these regional variations are also expected to continue into the future. So this is another future climate projection for uh, changes in precipitation by the mid 21st century. And you can see that poor, poor Ontario here in the east is expected to see the highest increases in annual precipitation. And that's unfortunate because they already experience a lot of flooding and they can expect that to get worse. But then you look at, at uh, Michigan here and we are expected to see far less increases in precipitation. Uh, still increases, but just less. But this is just annual total average precipitation where things get a little more interesting and problematic is when we have extreme precipitation or very strong storms. And we define these as days or periods of 24 hours that have 1.25 inches or more of rainfall. And obviously there can definitely be much more than that in that period of time, but that's where things start to uh, cause some small issues like nuisance flooding and street closures and whatnot. Uh, and these types of events have increased by 34.7% since 1951. And in the future, Great Lakes is expected to see 
an increase of about one to two more days of extreme precipitation events. But again, this is an average. So you can still have some years where you have no extreme precipitation days, and then other years where you have 10 extreme precipitation days. And it all averages out to be one to two days. And rainfall is not the only form of precipitation that is changing. So we're also, we've also seen changes in snowfall patterns in the Great Lakes. So this is a, a GIF or GIF, whatever you want to call it. It's an animation that shows the changes that have already occurred in the snowfall patterns. So you've got uh, the blue header, which is the 1961 to 1990 average, and you've got the red header, which is the 1981 to 2010 average. And one of the first things you might notice is that the Upper Peninsula and part of the western, the northwestern Lower Peninsula, where we are right now, have actually seen increases in snowfall in the lake effect zones. And this is expected, this makes sense, because warmer winter temperatures and warmer lake temperatures, less ice cover, all of this leads to more open water and more moisture available for these cold air masses to pick up as they move across the lakes and then dump it on everybody here. Just so nice. And then when you look further south, when there's but there's no lake effect in places like Indiana and Illinois. You actually just see these bands of snowfall shifting northwards, so each latitude is receiving less and less average snowfall. And a lot of this is typically because a lot of winter snowfall is becoming winter rain, so spring again is shifting a little bit earlier. Uh, so the Great Lakes themselves do play a role in regulating our climate, and they will influence the types of changes that we're seeing across the region. And to think a little more bigger picture, we like to use this graphic, which just shows what Michigan might feel like by the end of the century based on a few different climate model, climate change scenarios. So what this is telling you essentially is that Michigan, or specifically Michigan summers, will feel more like current summers in Arkansas or in Oklahoma in terms of what temperatures will be like, what precipitation patterns will be like. And so apparently, if you would like to get an idea of what our climate will be like by the end of the century, you'll visit Arkansas. All right, so that's the gist of climate trends in the Great Lakes. There's obviously more to it than that, but I think that's that's the big picture. So now I want to talk more about the actual impacts, the local impacts that these translate into. And this is not in any way an exhaustive list of every impact, every climate change impact in the Great Lakes. I would have to be standing up here all day if I was going to tell you every impact. But Hopefully it's a good overview. So one of the more prominent impacts that you hear about when you when you think of climate change in the Great Lakes is that of harmful algal blooms. So harmful algal blooms form when there's a combination of factors including sunlight, high temperatures, and nutrients, and specifically toxins. That's what makes uh, an algal bloom turn into a harmful algal bloom. And some of the factors that contribute to these algal blooms have been uh, affected by the local climate changes that we're seeing in our temperature trends and our precipitation trends. So increases in precipitation, or more specifically, earlier shifts in springtime rain and more extreme precipitation events has led to more runoff from agricultural lands, from farmlands uh, surrounding the lakes. So this takes the fertilizer and these nutrients like phosphorus from the farmlands and runs them off into the lake so that there's greater nutrient loading in the lake for these algal blooms to form. And then you have the warmer water temperatures, which actually affect the physics and the dynamics of the lake. So the warmer surface temperatures typically don't mix as much with uh, the lower, colder layers of the water. So they're more stratified, which means that these this greater amount of nutrients than just sits in this warm, shallow water on the surface and just stagnates. And that's what allows these wounds to multiply and grow so large. Um, I think it was four years ago that Toledo, it was a half a million people in Toledo went without clean drinking water for a few days because of that harmful algal bloom that had all these toxins that were affecting the water quality and they, that's where Toledo gets its um, drinking water from. And algal blooms also cause um, hypoxia events, which is just a fancy way of saying low oxygen because al algae, when it dissolves, it uses up oxygen so then there's not enough left for fish to survive in that part of the water, so that creates these dead zones. And these harmful algal blooms are typically more of an issue in Lake Erie and even the Florida Gulf Coast because they are areas with warm and shallow water. They're not 
as big of an issue in the upper Great Lakes because they're deeper and colder, but you can't mention Great Lakes and climate change in the same sense without thinking about the impacts of outflows. And another impact that's gotten a lot of attention in the last year, especially with all those powerful hurricanes we had in 2017, has been that of stormwater. So these increases in average precipitation, but more so the increases in extreme precipitation events has led to more, more flooding events, more local flooding, um, runoff events, and a lot of stormwater drainage systems in the Great Lakes just don't have the capacity to accommodate for such large volumes of water in such a, a short period of time, and that's what leads to street flooding and road closures. Uh, here's, a, here's a couple examples of this. So the top left, yeah, top left picture is uh, from the Bad River Band, I think this was 2016, and this was from a single very strong storm that just flooded their entire reservation and knocked out their main road uh, to the mainland because it took out this, this bridge, which isn't exactly just a tiny pothole that can be fixed. And the bottom right picture is actually the National Guard setting up sandbag barriers in New York, which clearly aren't really doing a great job considering mm -hmm. the water level is the same on both sides of the, uh, the sandbag dam. And this was during the Lake Ontario flooding events of 2017. And this actually occurred exactly a year ago, it was May 2017. And this was the result of sustained heavy precipitation over the Lake Ontario basin that took water levels on Lake Ontario. They had a, a rapid, actually record increase. And then they reached record levels in May that actually persisted through June and July. And this caused shoreline flooding and erosion and flooded all these thousands of shoreline homes in both New York and Ontario, Canada, and even as far downstream as Montreal. Uh, I think they're still recovering from it, and there's still a lot of um, research being done in this particular event, because just a few years prior to this, Lake Ontario was actually at uh, below average water levels, and then a few months prior to this, they were at average water levels. There was no warning that this was going to happen. It doesn't take very long for uh, extremes to swing from uh, one extreme to the other, which is why it's important to plan for multiple extreme scenarios rather than just say one average scenario. <coughs> Speaking of lake levels, this is probably uh, an impact that hits close to home here. I've, I've already mentioned it in my, in my story at the beginning. So water levels in the Great Lakes are mainly driven by precipitation, evaporation, and runoff. So unlike the oceans where sea level is just expected to continue increasing with uh, rising global temperatures, water levels in the Great Lakes will not just go up or go down uh, as a result of climate change. The, the changes in precipitation, which also affect runoff, and the changes in temperature, which affect evaporation, will play a role in, in how we see the lake levels changing in the future. So we will see the impacts of climate change on the Great Lakes. So we, we may already have seen it, but it's you can't pinpoint any one event like the Lake Ontario floods and say that's climate change. Climate is more uh, long-term averages. But historically, we've seen uh, some changes. We've, we saw high water levels in the 1980s. I think they were actually record high water levels. And they decreased to about average in the 1990s until we had that really warm El Nino year in 1998 where they just shot down even further and then they stayed below average for about 15 years until we had a very, very high ice cover year in 2014 that made them shoot back up again and that's where they've stayed. And these types of fluctuations and changes in water levels can be uh, forecasted and projected using climate models, but the state of these models is not really, they're not ready to be reliably used in any sort of decision making. I actually did my, my research in grad school was on forecasting water levels in the Great Lakes, and our conclusions were basically the climate models aren't good enough to forecast the hydrologic conditions that give us these um, long-term water level forecasts. Some of the early models actually pointed to, well, the Great Lakes water levels are actually going to go down. But then more recent models have called into question some of the, the physics that were used in those old models. So there's still a lot of uncertainty. But one thing that is certain is that whether water levels do go up or go down or stay the same on average, they will continue to fluctuate just because of the nature of the Great Lakes and being driven by precipitation and runoff and evaporation. So there still will be short-term variability or periods of high water levels and low water levels. The question is more, how much will they be impacted by these local changes in, in precipitation and temperature trends? Um, that's something that's still being explored. 
I probably don't need to, to tell you this, but water level uh, fluctuations do have some impacts on the Great Lakes and our economy, whether it's low water levels that cause issues for boating and tourism and shipping and navigation and recreation, and uh, they cause there to be more care. Marinas and canals and harbors need to be dredged more, or if it's when water levels are very high and they cause issues with shoreline flooding and erosion and property damage, or if they don't fluctuate enough and they can actually cause issues for coastal wetlands and ecosystems and breeding zones that actually depend on these fluctuations uh, for healthy ecosystems. And then ice cover actually functions somewhat similar, similarly to water levels in that they also they provide some protections to some coastal wetlands and fish spawning areas, and they provide the platform for uh, ice fishing and other winter recreation that's a very large part of our economy. And ice cover in the Great Lakes, I don't have this number on here, but they have declined by an average of over, of I think, 71% since 1975. That sounds like a very scary number, but this trend is not linear. This doesn't just mean that we're seeing less and less ice cover every year. It means on average we've seen that much of a decrease in ice cover. But there is still this natural variability that causes us to still have these single years where we are still experiencing high ice cover. And uh, 2014 is a good example. That was our, our polar vortex year that everyone was so worried about. And that was just when this frigid Arctic air escaped uh, from the polar vortex, which is the winds that circulate around the North Pole. They escaped southward and gave the Midwest a very cold, frigid, snowy winter that gave us almost record high ice cover. So just due to natural variability, there will still be years of high ice cover. You, you, you don't need to expect there to just never be ice cover again, but on average, it has declined and it will continue to decline. And water levels, or ice cover, also plays uh, a role in water levels in that Typically, low ice cover means more open water, so more evaporation can happen throughout the winter, which usually means lower water levels the following year, and vice versa. If there's high ice cover, there's high water levels. Uh, it's not quite that simple, but that's the gist of it. And this relationship between water levels and ice cover does play an important role in our shipping and navigation industry, which is also a very large part of our economy. But there's not really one ideal state of the lakes that's perfect for the shipping industry. So you can have the years where there's low ice cover and low water levels and that causes issues for shipping in that they, uh, ships have to lower their cargo load so that they can fit through these shallow canals and this causes, uh, this costs tens of thousands of dollars per trip which translates to hundreds of thousands or potentially millions of dollars per year. But then the low ice cover means that the shipping season can actually last longer. So do you make up that money? I don't know, I'm not in the shipping industry. Mm -hmm. but. Then there's also the vice versa situation where high ice cover means a shorter shipping season, but the high water levels mean that ships can load more cargo onto their vessels for each individual trip. So again, pros and cons to both. So there's not just one, like high water levels are good or low water levels are good. Both kind of have their pros and cons. And I briefly mentioned that water levels can influence uh, ecosystems and wetlands and whatnot, but the actual temperature trends and precipitation trends that we're seeing also play a role, are also influence or impact our plants and agriculture and wildlife. So forest ecosystems will actually start migrating northward following temperature trends because uh, certain tree species are just better equipped for colder temperatures. So as these colder temperatures shift more and more north, the ecosystems and trees will follow. So we've got this sort of deciduous forest deal going on around here with maple trees and beech trees and birch trees. And while it may not happen in our lifetime, these trees will eventually start to be displaced by new tree species that are better equipped to the new climate and the new temperatures. And a lot of trees just won't be able to keep up with the pace of climate change and we'll see uh, less diversity in how many species of trees we have. And a similar thing is also happening to species of mammal and birds uh, and some fish and that they're also migrating with uh, the warming temperatures and they face even more obstacles in their migration because we have a lot of, of agricultural land and farmland. So we will be seeing less and less biodiversity just because a lot of these species will not be able to keep up with the pace of climate change and decreases in biodiversity is never good for ecosystem health. And 
you'll also see declines in cold water fish populations just because uh, the water levels in the Great Lakes are warming and it's no longer uh, an ideal ecosystem for them to be in. And then lastly, some people have tried to make the argument that climate change will actually be a good thing for agriculture because the growing season will be longer, or my personal favorite, there's more CO2 available for plants. And <laughs> yes, that's why it's my favorite. And some of these things may be true and may, may help in the short term, maybe by the mid 21st century, but certainly by the end of the century when we start seeing more issues with water scarcity, warm spells, and late spring freezes, and flooding, and drought, these things will significantly outweigh those two positives. Um, but I think there's some talks later today that talk more about some of these specifics, so I won't go into more about that. So again, that was in no way an exhaustive list of every impact, but I hope it gave you a, a good general overview. Um, check the time. Okay. So now I just want to close with a few quick examples of some adaptation efforts that GLISA has been a part of. Now, GLISA does not actually do any adaptation work ourselves, but we have partnered with cities and organizations that have, and our role in these projects is essentially just to provide the climate information background to form whatever vulnerability assessment or adaptation plan that uh, they're doing. So I think I have three examples here, and the first two are both partnerships that we had with the National Park Service because they were, or still are, trying to integrate climate change adaptation into their park management. So the first was uh, a project for Iora Island National Park, which is the island up near uh, the Canadian border, up in Lake Superior, and they were worried about their wolf population. They still are worried about it because wolves come to the island by crossing the ice on Lake Superior in the winter, and then there's this delicate wolf, moose, predator, prey population balance on the island. But in so many recent years when there hasn't been enough ice cover, stable ice cover on the lakes for the wolves, for new wolves to cross in the winter, um, there's been a really steady decline in the wolf population on the island. I think there were 10 wolves back when they first contacted us, and now there's only two, I'm pretty sure was the last number. And they wanted to know how much of a problem will this be in the future? Is this, is this the new normal? Is this what we should expect? Should, should we always expect there to be too little ice cover for wolves to cross? And what will this mean for the delicate closed ecosystem on the island and how much should we be doing uh, to respond to this or can we do anything? So we provided some uh, climate scenarios for them in terms of future ice cover, lake levels, uh, temperature and whatnot so that they could examine different potential scenarios. And I think last we heard, we don't always get to uh, hear the end results of what we contribute to, but I think last I heard they were strongly considering introducing 30 new wolves to the island, so I guess they've made up their decision, but don't quote me on that because I don't think that's official. And then we have an ongoing project, again with the National Park Service in the Ohasa Islands National Lakeshore, which is off the northern coast of Wisconsin, also in Lake Superior, and this is where those big, beautiful ice caves form in the winter that you probably see on the news every year. And this park has a lot of uncertainty associated with it in terms of when it can be open because the ice conditions have to be stable enough to be safe for all these visitors <laughs> to venture out onto the ice and mostly for safety reasons because if, if you know, get out to these ice caves and then you need help, there's not a lot of support. There's not a particularly big staff uh, at the Apostle Islands Park. So in recent years, they've had these huge mass influxes of people both in 2014 and 2015 where they were just completely overwhelmed and unprepared for the amount of people who came. Um, in 2015 on opening day there were cars lined up for four miles in both directions to come visit the ice cream. So they didn't even have enough parking, let alone staff to accommodate for, for these mass influxes of people. So they contacted us because they wanted you know, a better way to forecast, short term forecast uh, for ice cover to have a better idea of when the conditions would be suitable for the park to be open so that they can manage their park a little more efficiently and be prepared for these events. So this is an ongoing project. We actually also partnered with the, the Great Lakes Environmental Research Lab to work on some new statistical forecasting uh, options or models that would actually allow us to forecast ice cover in the short term because it's not just influenced by temperature, it's also <coughs> winds and all these other things that play a role. So we're just trying to help them. There's a lot of uncertainty associated with this part, and we're just trying to help decrease that uncertainty a little bit. 
lastly, this is actually kind of <coughs> two things that tie together, but Lisa provided the climate uh, information background for the Detroit Climate Action Plan, which was released last fall, yeah, fall 2017. And this plan dealt with a few different major sectors, including public health, businesses and institutions, solid waste, park public spaces, water infrastructure, homes, and neighborhood. Uh, a few, right? And the hope is that this plan can be used, be useful to city planners in planning for the future development of their city, for sustainable development, for land use, for deciding um, the future of certain buildings and whatnot. Uh, so we'll see how that actually plays out. And then Lisa has also recently partnered with some cities in the Great Lakes Climate Adaptation Network, which is just a, a network of cities in the Great Lakes region that uh, is essentially just city officials from various cities in the Great Lakes that share and collaborate um, on their local adaptation efforts. And they give ideas to each other and update on what their current efforts are. And we partnered with five of these cities last year to provide the, the climate basis, the climate information, the historic trends, and, and future model projections for uh, these cities to create their own vulnerability assessments for their cities. And, and we contributed to a tool that was put together by the Huron River Watershed Council that actually allows for other cities beyond the five that we worked with to actually curate their own uh, vulnerability assessments, which is the first step to adaptation efforts. Uh, and I think we just got more funding for this to potentially expand this to other cities. So we mostly worked with larger cities like Cleveland and Evanston, Evanston and Ann Arbor. So I think we're trying to expand it out a little further. So uh, you might see more about this in the future. It might actually be helpful to you someday. All right, so with that, hopefully you learned something today. Uh, Thank you so much for listening to me and thank you for having me. I'd be happy to answer any questions in the time that we have, but also if you think of anything later, feel free to reach out to me by email or come up to me after this is over. Thank you. Thank you.